morning to you, Tracy. A um, very quick Good rebuttal morning. from Downing Street, um, some might say, um, before perhaps we've had the chance to properly uh, debate all of this. What's your view? Do you think, you know, they're controversial, but is there is there an appetite perhaps growing for them, given the way we live now? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think from about 2016, 17, I'd noticed that um, we were starting to need more digital verification and authentication because obviously a lot of our public sector services are becoming digitized. Um, but it's not so much a digital identity card that's being proposed. It's a set of what they call verifiable credentials, which might sit in a digital wallet. So in a sense, we're echoing what we do in the physical world, but with a digital version. I think that's that's quite an important um, point to make, really. It's not a card. It's some credentials that um, are given to you that you then use in the way you want to and only share the information that you want to with certain people. So it's it's privacy protecting. And I think that's a very, very important point. I suppose in a world where none of us go anywhere without a mobile phone, it would be ever so handy to have your passport, your driving license on there. Speaking as someone who picked up her daughter's passport recently, it went off on holiday and then couldn't go because I yeah. got the wrong one. I always got my no, phone. So, so, but the world's moved on, perhaps. Well, I totally get what you're saying in terms of convenience you know whether it's a passport whether it's a a, a national insurance number mm -hmm. whether it's your driving license yeah. we could go on and on and on um, and you can have all that for convenience yeah. sake but equally tracy there are going to be a lot of people who are going to be jumping out of their skin and go oh that infringes my human rights that is a uh, the big brother state um taking over so there is this massive um, practical aspect to all of this which would help all of us in our day-to-day -day lives and there is this intrusion aspect as well. Yes, absolutely. Now I think what's happening is um, there are lots of different types of digital identity system. So for example in China, as you probably know, they have a kind of social credit scoring system but they have a unique um, identity, I think it's 18 digits, and that is linked to um, lots of the services that they access. Similarly, uh, there is the RDAR system in India. Again, that is anchored with a biometric, in fact, two biometrics. I think it's fingerprint and uh, facial recognition, like you know, a face print. Um, and that's a system that gives access to government services. But again, that is very centralized. What we're talking about in the UK, which is already underway, which is one of the interesting and odd things about this intervention from Tony Blair and um, Lord Haig, is it's already underway that we have a decentralized system where we are given credentials um, that don't allow the government to track us necessarily. Um, nobody's really uh, looking at every time we uh, do an interaction. It's really more about sharing the data in an encrypted way so that we do have our privacy protected and so that we aren't, as you say, in a situation where we have our civil liberties um, infringed and certainly in a way that we're not even, um, you know, we don't have any knowledge of um, who's looking at our personal data. With the verifiable credentials in these sorts of new systems, they sit in your digital wallet and you have absolute control over how they use. Well, that is the theory anyway. Now, let me just put it blatantly to you. The program targets the birth of new babies. So once you have your baby, before your baby leaves the hospital, you no longer get a paper birth certificate, but then you get a digital one that is somehow implanted somewhere on somebody's body. Think about that, but have a listen to this. Um, the digital ID, which has been a big problem to us for a very long time, is now on a testing mode for the next two months. I have been assured by all the stakeholders, all the stakeholders, all the stakeholders, led by the ministries concerned, that by December we will be able to launch digital ID where every Kenyan don't have to carry any paper, plastic or otherwise, as an ID that they should be able to be identified digitally using their iris. We're taking things that are, you know, genetically modified organisms and we're injecting them in little kids' arms. We just shoot them right into the vein.
Kenya is in serious trouble. Now, for you to accept this, that means you're going to be completely surveilled and controlled. Think about it. So Aujourd'hui, au bout de ça, on parle de puces qu'on pourra s'implanter. Ce sera quand, ça Certainement dans les dix années à venir. Et d'abord, on va les implanter dans nos vêtements, uh -huh. c'est-à-dire wearables, comme on le dit. Et après, on pourrait s'imaginer qu'on les implante dans nos cerveaux ou dans nos topos. Et à la fin, peut-être il y a une communication directe entre notre cerveau et le monde digital. Ce que nous voyons, c'est une sorte de fusion du monde physique, digital et biologique. No, I think maybe in a couple of decades when people look back, the thing they will remember from the COVID crisis is this is the moment when everything went digital. And if, this, is, this was the moment when every, everything became monitored. That we agreed to be surveyed all, all the time not just in authoritarian machines, but even in democracies. And maybe most importantly at all, this was the moment when surveillance started going under the skin. Started going under the skin. Started going under the skin. Because really we haven't seen anything yet. I, I think that the big process that's happening right now in the world is uh, hacking human beings, the ability to hack humans. When I make a phone call, if I don't have uh, an earpiece, uh, I have to take this flat piece of material and put it against my curved head and hold my arm up in an awkward position. Uh, and sooner or later, this light phone gets heavier and heavier. It, it, it is not optimum for speech. You, in your generation, certainly the next generation, uh, will have uh, the phone uh, maybe embedded under the skin near there, embedded under the skin near there. Their ear, and they'll get the, uh, they, they won't have to have a uh, charging, which is a real pain, as you know, uh, because your body is, is a perfect charger. How have the central bankers, this is my last slide, because my 12 minutes is just up, have reacted to the truth coming out? They admit that they've been telling porkies, and now they propose to increase their power. So central bankers belatedly admit, oh, oh, now that you've mentioned it, uh, yes, banks create the money supply. Um, so uh, let's abolish that now. <laughs> um, and also, by the way, let's abolish cash. So what should we do? Well, introduce digital cyber currency that central banks issue and control, and thereby gain total control over all economic transactions, decisions, and the whole lot you've just heard from the CEO of the GDI. So the greatest concentration of central banking power in history is really the bid they're aiming at. That's the central bank's goal. And of course, digital accounts of um, dissenters and regime critics could be switched off. It'd be very difficult to even purchase necessities. So this is an Orwellian dystopia of total control, the end of any freedoms. That's um, really what central banks are aiming at. Several central banks have like the Bank of England already prepared their microchip implant RFID chip to be implanted under your skin. Microchip implant RFID chip to be implanted under your skin. Microchip implant RFID chip to be implanted under your skin. Um, and why is the sudden discussion about universal basic income from all the grassroots and inverted commas movements and billionaires. Oh, universal basic income is the bribe for you to accept the microchip. The overarching trend of the 20th century is concentration of power in the hands of the few. That's what we have to keep in mind. We have to work against this. We don't want to have these unaccountable central planners making decisions. We need decentralization. And the solution, therefore, is to maintain public money in the hands of local community banks, decentralize decision making, give local people the power in the form of local public banks and local not-for-profit community banks. As I walked in, I was delighted to see that the um, Gottlieb Duttweiler Institute is also about Genossenschaft and cooperatives. And of course, the majority of banks in Germany are cooperative banks. Um, and that's really what we need.